how to mute myself. Oh, okay, yeah, star six. Okay. Okay, and, and uh, all right, just hit star six to um, mute yourself, and star six again, it's a toggle switch, so star six to unmute. And um, tonight we're going to keep the show in um, host, oh, all mode, so everybody can talk. And the only thing you need to do to mute or unmute is star six. This is episode five, the status correction series. Uh, it is about 3 o'clock Alaska time, 3.03 Alaska time on the 25th day of November of 2018. We are having about four hours of daylight now. I'm Maria Rensel, and this is Foundations. Welcome to our series on status correction. We begin tonight pre-recording our macro worldview on status correction, what it is, theories behind it, how it can help you, all viewed through the lens of civil law and uh, for tonight and later the lens of common law. Um, we're pre-recording our discussions to share on the TalkShoe platform. We'll actually be recording several episodes before inviting an audience to participate in the discussion. Sometime probably in January of 2019, we'll begin inviting audience participation once the groundwork has been laid. So this is the Foundations radio show on TalkShoe. Look for episodes in the neighborhood of episode 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 for the introduction to status correction. I'm joined by Patrick from Michigan, who has been studying this issue and related issues for the past several years and has lots to share with us. Hi, Patrick. Um, I'll let Hello. you go ahead and share some of your background. All right, yeah, my name is Patrick. I've been studying this on and off for probably close to 10 years now. Um, I think the first introduction to a lot of this stuff was probably a, a film by Aaron Russo. Uh, called Freedom to Fascism. They really opened my eyes up to the IRS and a lot of the taxing issues that we're dealing with. Um, I further studied, you know, multiple different teachers. Uh, it was from dealing with common law, dealing with commerce, dealing with private remedies, uh, Harvard Van Dyke, Winston Shroud. I mean, a lot of names people are probably familiar with in the uh, freedom movement, if you can call it that. Uh, my primary interest is just trying to understand and uh, learn um, why why we're in the situation we are and then try to assess the proper steps to take and procedure to follow through in order to correct um, the errors that seem to be uh, taking place on a regular basis nowadays so um, I don't really have a dog in the fight other than just wanting to want to be able to express freedom for people uh, freedom of choice you know freedom of uh, business and uh, and let society kind of steer the course of, of culture instead of instead of a legislative body of people. Um, that's that's really my interest in it, and that's that's why I study a lot of this. So I guess with that, uh, I can turn it back okay. to you. <laughs> sure, sure. Your your father's joining us as well. Um, that's uh, Mike. Mike, would you share a little bit of your background with us? Yes, uh, I'm from Michigan. Um, I guess that you could say I woke up uh, after 9-11. I knew something wasn't right, and what they're showing us on television was certainly not correct. And that's what kind of started our journey of uh, investigating. And one thing led to another, like Patrick had mentioned, Winston Shrout, Roger Elvig, um, Anna. We've read Anna's stuff. And what I found, though, that I wasn't going back far enough. And Patrick went back further, and I believe he's found the, the root cause of what's is causing us a lot of the issues we have. So, and he can explain it a lot better than I can. <laughs> so I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> uh, very, very good. I, um, I just wanted to mention my perspective a little bit lately in the last three or four years, Bill and I have been studying common law. Um, but as far as the status issue, we, we had a, a common law study group that was a combination Bible study and common law study. And we studied the L.B. Bork treatise called the Red Amendment. 
And we've also been studying the uh, Brent Winters book, Excellence of the Common Law, as well as several of his lectures, radio interviews. Um, he, he actually compares and contrasts common law and civil law in that book. Um, we've read most of the essays on AnnaVonWrites.com. We know Anna. Um, she's from up here, and uh, we met her back when we were um, politically active. And so basically, all of our political act activity has given way to understanding common law and status correction issues. So, um, so that's my background, and we'll start to we can explore that some of my um, quirks later. But what I wanted to talk about before I let you take it away, Patrick, and explain what you've discovered is that uh, some of the things that we'll be studying in this series just by looking at the keywords, and I'm sure I've missed some, and so you can fill in the details on that, but some of the keywords are civil law, citizenship, citizen, state citizen, resident, inhabitant, domicile, national, nationalist, individual, taxpayer, public law, private law, civil law, commercial law, jurisdiction, venue, common law, um, English versus American common law, man, woman, person, human, uh, parents, patre, Republican, as in Republican form of government, democracy, um, things like social compact, social justice, society, property rights, liberty, freedom, uh, law of the land versus law of the city, and maxims of common law. So th those are some of the things that come up when I think about this status issue. Um, we all are familiar with the term civil rights. So uh, a few weeks ago, we were on a teleconference. Uh, was the National Jural Assembly teleconference? I heard Patrick bring up the discussion of the issue of civil status correction. So we're familiar with civil rights, but I really perked up and wanted to hear more about this. Um, it was a new correction issue, which I hadn't been familiar. Um, so Patrick and I started emailing and realized the importance of instructing people on this issue, and that's what we are planning to do, uh, planning to do now. And, and so I'll give you the floor, Patrick, and, and I'd love to hear about what it is that you've uncovered. Yeah, okay, so just following up on that, when you mentioned civil rights, um, part of my research has, has kind of dug into what, who, who that really applies to. You know, civil rights were passed um, from, for U.S. citizens. Um, so U.S. citizens is a different class of status than what was known before the 14th Amendment as a state citizen. Uh, so civil, stat, civil rights do apply to U.S. citizens. Natural rights would be what we're looking for as a state citizen. These are, you know, the ones that were talked about under the Declaration of Independence as the inalienable rights, you know, um, our capacity to do, you know, whatever we wanted as long as it did not cause an injury or, or trespass on another man. So uh, you see this huge divide between, or almost this word game they play <laughs> with different definitions in what, what put people assume they mean without actually diving into what what's underwriting them or what's the source of it. A lot of my research comes back to the domicile, as you had mentioned, and particularly under conflict of laws, um, which is an extension of private international law. Private international law is mostly in regards to, again, contract law. This is private law. It's between the parties of the contract. And in any disputes of contracts, usually the conflict of law goes down to the, to the domicile of the entities involved to, de to determine who has jurisdiction. And there are multiple ways that this can, can impact people, especially when they don't understand that the own divide we have within our own country. So when the states got together and formed the United States as a national or as a federation of states, they subrogated certain uh, duties to them. 
that were of national interest, remaining with all remaining rights still reserved for the states or for the people. So we look at a lot of these problems and people think that the government has somehow changed. Um, my research points to more is the status of the individuals has changed, which has then related in the change of how we interact with our government. So part of what I've tried to uncover is how do we establish a domicile and how would we claim a state citizen status under private international law? And most of my research goes back to the Social Security application, the SS5 form. Um, I know a lot of people in the movement out there keep pointing the fingers at the birth certificate as the primary document that created the, uh, the issue with the change of our status and the loss of our rights as being registered property. I think it's a little bit more complicated than that. I, I think that's overly simplified. Um, and part of what I use as a reference to that is, if, if I just sort of uh, cite a court case here, it is United States versus Wong Kim Ark uh, from 1898, in which, as I quote, the law of England and almost all civilized countries ascribes to each individual at his birth two distinct legal states or conditions, one by virtue of which he becomes the subject of some particular country, binding him by the tie of natural allegiance, and which may be called his political status, another by virtue of which he has ascribed to him the character of a citizen of some particular country, and as such is possessed of certain municipal rights and subject to certain obligations, which latter character is the civil status, or condition of the individual and may be quite different from his political status. And then while maintaining that the civil status is universally governed by the single principle of domicile, the criterion established by international law for the purpose of determining civil status and the basis on which the personal rights of the party, that is to say the law which determines his majority or minority, his marriage, secession, testacy, or intestacy must depend. So by looking through that court case, it seemed pretty clear that a lot of these research is very, it's not necessarily wrong, but it's what I would consider like a half truth. It's not the whole story. And it seems they work very hard to keep that under wraps. Um, another piece of information that I've used to kind of piece this together would be just looking up the definition of domicile in your Black's Law Dictionary. And now this is where it gets a little tricky with multiple meanings for, for the same words. And under the Black's Law de definition, it says, uh, one of the sites right on here is a Hendry versus uh, Masonite Corp uh, case, which states, for purposes of federal diversity jurisdiction, citizenship and domicile are synonymous. So that was the first time I'd ever read that. And I found that very interesting to think that, well, all this time I'm thinking a U.S. citizen is just in reference to a political status. Now I'm finding out that there's a whole other body of law that is in relation to a person's civil status and that citizenship could actually mean domicile. So upon applying that to the SS5, uh, particularly box number five, where it's asking for your citizenship, they give you only a couple of options there. And Social Security does not really go in any depth as far as describing or defining the terms they're using on their forms. And they seem to very routinely use legal alien and the lawful alien interchangeably. Um, from my understanding research, those are two, there's essentially two different bodies of law there. The lawful alien is in relation to public international law, and it has to do with foreign born nationals, people outside of the country known as the United States of America as the whole. Then we also have where they, the box, you can check off legal alien. Now legal alien, um, again, is not the same as lawful alien. And from, I think it was Jim that was on your show that I listened to, and he said, anytime you hear the word legal, think contract, think contract law. And contract law is private law. So me as a state citizen under private contract law, I would be claiming that to be an alien to the United States. Now you might get kind of confused and ask, well, how is this possible? You now live in the United States. And under public international law, that would be true. I do live in the United States of America as a whole. It includes the 50 nation states of the union, and it also includes other federal territories. 
Um, but now when I go to private international law, saying U.S. citizen is essentially saying I'm a U.S. domicile. And United States and private international law is the District of Columbia. It is, you know, that's where they're domiciled. The seat of government is domiciled in D.C. In the, in the exclusive jurisdiction of D.C. only extends to federal territory. It does not extend to the states. They only have subject matter jurisdiction um, when, in regards to the states of the union. So under private international law, if I want to be a state citizen, I would be considered an alien to the United States. And there's also some other, you know, again, more detail and sites that would prove um, that the United States operates, and, you know, in its business capacity and contract as a foreign entity in relation to the states. So that kind of, I mean, this is kind of where I'm going with trying to understand the application of private international law and public international law, um, how they overlap, what, in what capacity, in what context these words are being used. Um, because it comes back to the same thing. If I, if I were to say, you know, are, are you a U.S. citizen, you would have to first ask, where well, are you talking in regards to politically or legally? You know, politically, under public international law, I would be. I have a United States passport. Um, and it, you may find it interesting when you go and actually read your passport. It doesn't really even call you a citizen. It says nationality. And the nationality is that of the United States of America. So to me, the United States of America represents the country as a whole. The United States is, operates sometimes as a federal government for the states. And it can also operate as its own entity as a business to do contracts, to sue and be sued, right, to hold, to hold property. Um, so it also, I guess, expands a little bit more when you include the 14th Amendment. Um, with the, when the 14th Amendment was put on the books, it essentially allowed the United States to claim quasi-nation state status because now they had their own people. Uh, previous to the 14th Amendment, U.S. citizens were only state citizens or government employees or something like that, but there was no specific term for a U.S. citizen. With the past 14th Amendment, they created this second-class citizenship, um, which the courts have routinely ruled on, and, and they've been in agreement on this, that it, it, they do not get the Bill of Rights. They do not have the protections um, afforded to state citizens because the United States is a subsidiary. They're under the authority of the states. The United States doesn't have the capacity to grant U.S. citizens the same rights and defenses of state citizens because that would be a violation of, of like the laws of creation, jurisdictional boundaries. So as a U.S. citizen, this is why now later it's, it puts you under a legislative democracy. Um, and this is in accordance with the Constitution. Uh, Congress was granted um, the right to make all needful rules regarding U.S. property and, uh, and, uh, and federal territory. So if you're claiming a U.S. domicile, that essentially uproots you off of your state citizen status, your state domicile, puts you into their jurisdiction, to their venue, for which now you become able to be administrated. Um, they have authority over you, and, and it is in alignment with the Constitution as far as I understand it. Uh, this is what then further led into the change of currency in the 30s when FDR um, took office and declared the national emergency and essentially led to the United States pledging all the property of the people. Now, again, the United States doesn't have the capacity to pledge the property of state citizens. So the property that was pledged was only U.S. citizens. So in order to extend their ability to create more debt or to create their, extend their jurisdiction, their boundaries, they had to figure out a way of how to convince or how to get people into identifying as being a U.S. citizen. From my understanding, because the Social Security Act was passed in 1935, and it was directly after the Securities and Exchange Act of 34. Um, so these were all the preceding events that they put into place to help change the status of the individual so that they could claim authority and jurisdiction over, over people that previously um, did not have any obligation to them. Okay, so can I stop you for a minute there and just ask yes. a few questions that have come up? Yes. Okay, um, and just <clears throat> for clarification, and I'm not even sure, um, I'll just ask the questions that came up for me, and then Mike, I'll give you a chance to, to make some clarifications if you, if you want to do that. Um, first of all, the court case U.S. versus Wong Kim Ark. How do you spell Wong Kim Ark? It is W-O-N-G. Uh-huh. K-I-M. 
Mm-hmm. A R K. A R K. Okay. Yep, and I can give you the site too. It's actually at one six nine mm-hmm. U dot S dot six four nine um, from eighteen ninety eight. Eighteen ninety eight. Correct. Okay. All right, and that's I put that out there for people who'll be listening to this on the replay to find out. Yep about the two distinct, um, when you're born, you take on two distinct, did you say basically characteristics? Two legal states or conditions. Um, Okay, two legal conditions, okay. And there's actually kind of, there's another one that kind of piggybacks on that and it's actually a newer, uh, it's an executive order from 1999. It's executive order 13132. Mm -hmm. Which goes on further to say, because this is in regards to the principles of federalism, and this is just a short line here I'll read off. Um, the people of the states are free, subject only to the to restrictions in the Constitution itself or in constitutionally authorized acts of Congress to define the moral, political, and the legal character of their lives. So to me, this is them telling us again that you have a political character, you have a legal character. And they're reaffirming that the people of the states are free. They have no obligation to the United States. Other than to not do it injury, right? I mean, that's the common law principle. Mm-hmm. And it says moral, moral, political, and legal characters. Yep. 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 So, um, and so that kind of goes to what we know are the principles of common law, and we'll we'll talk about that another time. Yep. Okay. So, so I heard someone say recently, and I thought this was brilliant um he said that words he he uses words and these are things that are found in in dictionaries like webster's 1828 dictionary as opposed to uh terms of art which are what you find in black's law dictionary and he has made it uh, when he's in his court he's made it a uh You'll be held in contempt of court if you use terms of art in his court. Um, so mm-hmm. he's making the distinction between what we as statesmen need to be able to speak in common parlance and write about and use for for our uh, writings and speaking. And those are just he just defines them as words. But but um, a lot of the lawyers, all the lawyers, and and the the um, court system uses terms of art, and you'll find those in Black's Law Dictionary. So I thought that was pretty right. interesting. It is interesting, and if I could just add, to, because it is my understanding that when you when you have the proper standing as a state citizen, that as being domiciled in the state, then that's when you get the protection of the Constitution, which would then the state constitution plus the federal constitution. That would also limit their ability to use these terms of art, right? This trickery. They wouldn't have the jurisdiction to come in and administrate, right? Now they have to do the full process of, you know, seven elements of jurisdiction, where they're going to have to come in with sworn testimony under affidavit, you know, with an injured party. Um, those are the protections that apply to state citizens. So that's the importance of making sure the status is corrected, because it essentially heads off a lot of the problems we're dealing with right up front, you know, denying them access to the, these mechanisms that they've used once our status has been changed to a U.S. citizen. And and that's um, another area that I think it would be useful to take some time and and talk about the contrast. You're talking about private international law versus public international law. Can you explain just the basic uh, differences? Um, mostly just from what I can read. I mean, just from looking up even right off of Wikipedia. Um, so you see under conflict of laws is when you type in private international law on Wikipedia, conflict of laws is the first thing that comes up. And the mm-hmm. conflict of laws is, is dealing with, again, different legal jurisdictions. And it's between natural persons, companies, corporations, and other legal entities, their legal obligations, and the appropriate forum and procedure for resolving disputes between them. So and, and under the conflict of laws, the single principle used is the domicile. Domicile is what determines which jurisdiction you're under. And, and the private international law is going to apply to all, you know, contracts, any, any business that you do, really, because it, it is private law, and, it, and that's in commerce, it is usually the law is the agreement of the parties. 
So if you have a contract, again, that's you write your own law at that point. And if you violate your agreement, then the other party has, you know, every right to come in and, and, act and you know, file a claim against you in, in order to seek damages if you violate, you know, if it's a breach of contract issue. So is administrative law private? Is, is that synonymous, say, with private, mm -hmm. with contract law? Administrative law, from my understanding, would apply strictly to people within a certain body politic. So, so like as a U.S. citizen now, um, you're under, you can be administrated under U.S. laws, uh, codes and statutes, right? Whatever Congress says, you're essentially liable for. Now, as a state mm -hmm. citizen, you're not, you're not liable. You can't be administrated. You're, you're a foreign entity, right? You're an alien. Um, and you can even look to, I believe it's Title 18242 that talks about the use of color of law against aliens and that it is strictly prohibited. There is also 241, which is a conspiracy against rights um, mm -hmm. that could be used against them. Um, but a lot of those things, again, you're going to have a hard time standing on if you have the improper status. Um, I think it was even Anna talked about how for the longest time we're not even able to get our affidavits heard in court. I believe this to be the case. Why? We essentially have no legal rights. And um, so not having that status as a state citizen is let's, really let's, damaging. Let's, let me clarify. Let, let's clarify that. We, yep. when you say we don't have any legal rights, right. explain that a little bit more slowly. For, from my interpretation, I, I think uh, the way I've tried to describe it before is like an insurance policy for your car. When you sign up for that policy and you pay the fees, you've essentially subrogated your right to sue for damages in favor for the, the insurance company doing it on your behalf. Um, so I think it's operated along with the, the United States. Once you've claimed or you've operated it essentially as a U.S. citizen, as a U.S. person, a U.S. franchise, as an extension of the United States out of D.C., um, you have subrogated your defenses and your, and your standing as an individual to the United States. Um, they now have the capacity, and this is why they pass civil rights, and they have all the insurance policies in place to try to protect their citizens or any injuries that may happen. And then you have to file a claim with the United States just like you would with your insurance company. Okay, so that's so we're, we're interpretation of it. Okay, you and I are really on the same page then. So here's, mm -hmm. here's a, a picture I like to use. If you uh, think back to, or if you look at, you know, in your mind's eye, you look at a picture of, of the United States, the North American states, so the 50 states of the Union, and you've got a, a picture of that map in your head, and then you look at across the ocean to Europe, and you get a picture mm -hmm. of those uh, countries in your head. The countries of Europe are distinct sovereign entities. A German is not an Italian, is not a Frenchman. They have distinct nationalities. And that's pretty clear to us um, yep. looking back to the old countries. But now they have a new um, union, which is the European Union. Okay, we've got the EU. Yep. And so if a Frenchman decides to have dual citizenship, he's a, he's a, he's, or, or nationality even, if he decides to be a Frenchman and a European Union man, he's got dual citizenship. Now come back over to the United States and look at those distinct sovereign countries like Idaho and, and Montana and uh, um, Illinois and Florida um, and Alaska. Those are distinct nations. Those, yep. those at one point would have been distinct countries. And so our nationality would have been based on which one of those distinct countries we were born on. But it, but that that entity similar to the European Union was created around the, the end of the Civil War, had something to do with the 14th Amendment, and Washington, D.C. now was offering uh, um, free membership. So not mm -hmm. only could you be a citizen of your state, you could get a free membership in Washington, D.C. and get all kinds of uh, benefits. You could cash right. in. 
or if you were a newly freed slave, the, the narrative goes that none of the states would accept you. So you've got to be, you've got to be just just accept your citizenship in in D.C. Yeah. And, then, and that's probably yeah, from what I've heard, because uh, essentially the past reports you mentioned was there for slaves that were brought over here that were native born but they weren't giving like a birth certificate, right? They had no representation. They couldn't, they couldn't naturalize because they were already here. Um, and the states were essentially not giving them any protection. We're not looking out for them at all. Like they weren't not giving them the legal capacity to stand on their own in courts or anything. And that's part of the reason why the past 14th Amendment came in was to extend, yeah, that federal citizenship to those native born people that were brought here that were already living here. Um, and then they later used that as a, essentially as their gateway to get people to con- contract into being a U.S. citizen through, through law of contracts because right in the Constitution, it says right in it that the Congress cannot interfere with the obligations of contract. The contract law is, a, is the foundation of all law, from my understanding. All treaties are nothing but a contract, you know. So it all comes back to that contract law and agreement of the parties and there's also a quote from Lewis T. McFadden um, in the 30s talking about how attorneys were coming in there now claiming that Americans could, could contract away their constitutionally protected rights. And that was directly before the passage of the Social Security Act and the Securities and Exchange Act and all these things that went into place that I believe they used then to manipulate um, people's standing. So how did yeah, we go from... Oh, go ahead. Uh, I just want to clarify that the 14th Amendment didn't affect any of the uh, state citizens. It had nothing to do with state citizens. It had to do with um, the federal government and their citizens. That's how they created their, their citizens. Right, and that's what gave the United States the capacity to claim nation-state status because they had their own territory, they had their own form of government, and the only thing they were lacking was their own people. With the passage point to the amendment, now they had all three, as far as my understanding goes, of the qualifications to be considered a nation-state. They had territory, government, and people. And this is what really extended a lot of their jurisdictional boundaries that, that I, you know, again, the founders were, were trying to avoid this exact scenario. <laughs> of what we're now living under. Um, Well, and when we look at this dual citizenship, just thinking about that, we're, um, somehow we got, uh, somehow we got from a place where the citizenship in Washington, D.C. or U.S. citizenship was for freed slaves to be able to take on uh, a, a certain political status to the place where everyone born now on one of the states of of the 50 states of the union now has dual citizenship how'd that happen um or explains that that's an by operation of law and you can read about that under by reading and understanding better the 14th amendment is that your perspective no no i don't i don't think the dual citizen or the change of citizenship did not take place for most people in until the until the 30s um, like i said when they came out with this social insurance scheme um, there's a great quote from edward mandel house i don't know if you're familiar with him oh yes mm-hmm. he was dropped on um, his head as a baby, I, I understand he, he was he, <laughs> he yeah was wired a little different <laughs> <laughs> so there are people out there that let you know again but they operate from that perspective um they believe that they're you know these are this is the the elitist class that that think they have a right to rule over us um and there's nothing you're going to do to stop that there's always going to be people that have that mentality um so this is where i'm kind of concerned now i see a lot of people losing faith in law losing faith in the system as a whole wanting to trash the whole thing and i see a lot of benefits that it has provided i see a lot of growth and it has definitely come at a cost it has come at a risk but i see a way to navigate through it and learn what those risks are so we can we can cut the you know cut out the, the unnecessary risk that, are, that, that shouldn't be there um, and then keep the system as a whole in place because it provides a great deal of wealth and prosperity and opportunity for people. Okay, well, um, we probably disagree on that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. you know, 
I, you know, that's just, yeah, we'll, we'll, t we'll talk more about that down the road as we're just looking at the <laughs> distinctions between civil and common law and, and, I, and how I think we got here. So for me, you know, a big part of it happened in the 1860s there at just about after Lincoln was assassinated, before he was assassinated, the Reconstruction Acts and all of those things, but a lot of that opinion was shaped by the um, by L.B. Bork's treatise, so we, mm -hmm. we can look at it. It was also shaped by Brent Winters. Um, uh, he compares and contrasts civil law and what those, the origins of the civil law <clears throat> yeah, and yes. just for just for clarity's sake, I'm I'm in no way a, a advocate for civil law. I mean, all, all the stuff that I research is in alignment with the common law, and it is it's kind of a little difficult because they have blurred the lines between common law and equity. Right, um, law and equity are now kind of one and the same. Right. So that's where it gets a little tricky to navigate through. But in, in no way do I yeah do I see a benefit in going to any sort of civil law system. Um, Again, uh, the system of tort claims and all that stuff under the common law and letting society determine, you know, what it wants to determine risk or what it wants to assess, you know, or put claims against is, is to me, the best approach. Okay, so when you're talking about our system, what do you mean? Um, I mean, our original system of common law, I mean, of our, of our constitutionally limited republics. Um, okay. That essentially have been left in abeyance because once, as I'm saying, so once you've changed your status to U.S. citizen, you cannot rely on any of those things anymore. Um, you don't have access to a state constitution if you're domiciled in the United States. Um, it comes right back to like the preamble of the Constitution. It says, "We the people of the United States." So it might help for people to try to define well, what people are they talking about. They weren't talking about people of the world. They were talking about the people that were living under the the states. That, that, that were organized under the Republican form of governments that were established. Those are the people that were sent forward that created the Constitution, that wrote and signed to it. So that U.S. Constitution only applies to those people domiciled or living within the state. Those are we the people. That's my interpretation, so, at least. That's how I understand it. So let's, I mean, this, this isn't proper terminology or proper wording probably, but the common law <laughs> citizens of the states is what you're, who you're talking about. Right, because even when you go look at your state constitutions, and it's said the, the states were the ones that had original jurisdiction in law and equity. You know, and if we're not getting access to law and equity, I don't see it as a problem with this. Again, you can point the finger at the state, but I'm looking in, in the mirror going like, well, what did I do that I'm not being allowed access to the system of law that I know exists, that I know has been put into place? And that's where I believe it's through the compromising of the individual status that has now essentially let the governments off the hook because a person can only have one domicile. So you can't claim to be domiciled in the state and the United States. So if you've claimed this domicile in the United States, District of Columbia, you, you now this is where you become a state resident, right? A temporary person living abroad. Essentially, you're a U.S. citizen living abroad. Right. To engage in and commerce. I will eventually you, return home. That's there you what go. a resident. Yeah. Yep. So, so okay. So back to this Black's Law definition of domicile, saying that citizenship and domicile, uh, for some purposes, are synonymous. Um, yep. A domicile, just to be really, really simple and clear, is where you have your main house, where you actually live, your your main home. Right. They, and so they for also most, have, Americans, most Americans just have one house, and it's somewhere. It's on one of the land and soil on one of one of the states. So it's it's easy to see where that domicile is. It's where your house, where you live. Yeah, physically, yes. But they also have you now. You have a domicile of choice. You have domicile of origin. You have uh, also what they call an elected domicile. So this is a domicile of parties fixed in a contract between them for the purposes of such contract. So that could be easily applied to the SS5 and say that you're, you're electing a domicile that's different than your physical domicile, like you're saying. Like your house is obviously lo located on the land in the state. But if you've elected a US citizenship, a US citizen domicile in DC, essentially now in all your legal, because this is a security, this is the foundation of your essential legal person. This is the number that determines your tax status with the IRS. 
Yeah, so, absolutely. You have, you have no argument from me, but except for the fact that, okay, so you're going, you're saying block five of the SS5 is where you've, you've agreed that your domicile yeah. is somewhere other than when you, where you actually live where your house is and I'm just talking I'm just talking American I'm speaking in common parlance here yep where my yep. house is you know yep. my house is somewhere it's it's here in Alaska now so um right. so that talk a little bit about the SS5 and block 5 well part of the reason I come to that conclusion is like I said uh, if you go to definitions of terms at the Social Security Administration's webpage they they only define a lawful alien they do not define what a U.S. citizen is in their body of law. They do not define what a legal alien is. Because you could be a legal alien allowed to work or a legal alien not allowed to work. Um, if the form on, uh, on Block 5 were to say U.S. citizen or lawful alien, I would say it would be a little bit more questionable. And I, I'm not sure I'd come to the same conclusion because a lawful alien, again, to me, is something completely different than a legal alien. But the fact they're saying legal means contract to me. And contract law is private international law. And under private international law, all the states are foreign to each other, including the United States. So if I'm, if I'm not living, if I don't want to be considered, you know, a U.S. citizen or U.S. domicile, a U.S. person, a U.S. franchise, then I better not be checking U.S. citizen on citizenship block five because of the black law definition that says citizenship is domicile. So just think, in block five, instead of saying citizenship, say domicile. And now maybe that takes a different context when you're filling it out, going like, whoa, wait a second, where am I claiming my domicile is what they're asking, right? A citizen is a domicile, domicile e or whatever, right? It's an extension of whatever, wherever that place is incorporated. Well, D.C. is incorporated, or the United States is incorporated or a domicile in District of Columbia. District <laughs> of Columbia is outside the, the Constitution. The courts have repeatedly said that they have, Congress has sole jurisdiction, exclusive jurisdiction over all rules, and overall property. And they do not have to be in alignment with the Bill of Rights or any state constitutions or anything like that. I believe this is also why in I think two or three times they voted on DC to become incorporated into the union. And the last time they voted, it was 96% in favor of incorporating, yet they still haven't been made a state. And I believe this is why. If, if the United States was made incorporated into the union, the constitution would apply. And that means a lot of these administrative codes and statutes and laws that they've passed would have to be thrown out because they're in opposition, you know, they're repugnant to the principles of the Constitution. They would never be allowed. I've personally tried to go down to, F to Social Security and correct my status, and they have denied me. I've, I've failed twice now and currently have a claim in with my attorney general for, the, for my state for them to investigate because I guess that's what I'm looking for further clarity. If, if, if my research is wrong, then I guess I'm looking for the proof for them to tell me that it's wrong. And I've not heard back yet. You know, this is still an ongoing process for me. Okay, so have you, um, as far as going down this road, what, what is the remedy? That was the next obvious question. Correcting your status. Right. I believe there's a problem in, and then I gotta assume that it's because they're trained this way, but because there's just a lot of ignorance right now um, due to improper education, education and in, in how this is supposed to work. Because the response from Social Security when I sent it into mail was said that I lack to give them um, documents needed to show U.S. citizenship or lawful alien uh, status. Uh, so I sent in a U.S. passport. So if I send in a U.S. passport, how did I claim to establish U.S. citizenship? And they're under the assumption because I check legal alien that I'm claiming to be a lawful alien, which I very clearly am not. So this is where it gets into how, how do we make Social Security update those records? Because from, from my understanding, once that corrector is changed, that's your numinate record, right? That's your tax status number. Once that status changes to an alien, you, you now are filing under a 1040NR, a non-resident alien. And because okay, so you're saying... Yep. You're saying your your civil status should be alien. Legal alien in relation to the United States. Right. For tax purposes, because that. Yep. Okay. Under private international law. Correct. Okay, and and what about the term non-resident alien individual? Well, N R A I. Right. 
Right. So then, because even as an alien, you may reside within the United States, at which point they can't assess a tax, right? They have the ability to tax any business you do with them. That was one right. of the things, there was another court case uh, that talked about that, a state citizen of New York who ended up having to pay a tax um, because he was paid out dividends on a, from a railroad company, from railroad stocks he owned. Well, the railroad company was incorporated through the United States. See, that was a United States franchise. So even mm-hmm. though he was a state citizen, he had to pay a tax because he was doing business with the United States. Mm-hmm. Um, currently, a lot of people, again, this is the different boundaries. Like if you look at your states, um, any corporation that is set up or incorporated in a particular state, if it does business in a different state, they're registered as a foreign corporation, right? Mm-hmm. Because under private international law, they're all foreign entities. So this, right. the, the status that you have would change what your tax liabilities are. And from my understanding, this is essentially what it all boils back to is, is tax law. Um, because the United States uh, essentially signed itself over to the Federal Reserve, right, these international bankers, all these codes and statutes are there to raise revenue, to pay, to, to raise money for the taxes, for the debt that the United States has, you know, accrued to them, to the Federal Reserve. So the IRS is operating as that third-party debt collector coming in and collecting on, on those dues. So as a U.S. citizen, you're liable for that because you're operating as a franchise and an extension of the United States. As a state citizen, I am not. As a state citizen, you are not obligated to pay the taxes or the debts of the United States. You know, your obligation lies to your state. And under the Constitution, those states, those, those citizens, those people that lived in there and were registered under that, incorporated under that system of government, were protected against these encroaches, right? They were not allowed to tax people arbitrarily. There, there were certain rules and principles they had to follow if they were going to assess taxes. Right. Well, okay, and so earlier we were talking about how this condition came about. How did state citizens all become this, uh, come to this condition that we have today that they're dual citizens? You're saying that it happened as a result of um, FDR 1933, um, uh, basically a bunch of the pieces of the puzzle were fit together and the Social Security Act was passed. And we signed up for Social Security and we put in Block 5 that, that um, we were a citizen and domicile of Washington, D.C. Yep. That's yep, basically that piece... been done. Yep, and now the only other caveat is I'm not sure because they passed, I believe, the 17th Amendment or something had to do with voting for senators too. See, under the original form of government, we only voted for representatives. The representatives then appointed, you know, or elected the, their, the senators and the Electoral College who then, you know, voted on the president and vice president. So there is some, right. a little bit of body law out there in regards to, well, if you participate in the national vote, right, if you go kind of like, I think it was Samuel A. Gerard, right, the Amish guy that I'm sure a lot of people have heard about, who ended up getting mm-hmm. locked up for selling, for selling a salve. Well, I don't know if it's true or not, again, but the rumor was that he went and wanted, he voted for Trump. Because he believed wow. in the message Trump was setting. So if that is true, this is how, again, this would be another, like, a, a contract or another um, connection point, you know, where mm-hmm. if you go and participate in that national vote, you're putting yourself under that system of law. Right, right. Lots of different, lots of different um, contracts seem to be at play. Your voter registration, your marriage registration, your driver's license, maybe, right. your car registration, right. your security. Uh, election to pay taxes by filling out the 1040, uh, I don't know, birth registration, uh, military service. Right. Um, well, and, and, so, and just to, to try to boil this down, though, too, uh, it, it is, to me, it looks like that when you correct that, Newman and Rec, when you correct that SS5, now all these um, contracts, as you're describing later in life, there it changes uh, – the jurisdictional, you know, authority of the United States to intervene in those things. Because now, again, you're, all those contracts, right, there's all, and this is a lot of Gene Keating's research, where he's talking about your car loans, your mortgages, these are all investment contracts. These are all securities. Mm-hmm. Well, the main, the main thing that created your ability to get involved in that was the SS5. See, because your birth certificate is that of a natural person. This is what gives you the ability to do business in your private capacity. But it doesn't have anything to do with now getting involved in, in 
commercial ventures, right? Insurance, when you're getting involved in bonds and securities and, you know, the Wall Street type end of it, that, that's a different capacity. You can't do that in the private. You know, you have to, need, you need a straw man or you need, you know, that public something to interface with the commercial world. You so need a, my understanding. an incorporated entity to, to operate out of. I don't even, you not, have necessarily to be... not necessarily incorporate, because I don't, I don't believe, because again, like to be incorporated, you have to have a certificate of incorporation, right? And usually a certificate of incorporation is going to tell you where you're domiciled too, right? Like whose law firm are you under? Or who, who's your silent partner? Because like if you incorporate in, say, Michigan, Michigan's essentially your silent partner saying like, yeah, we're, we'll speak for your behalf. But if you violate any of these things, then we're going to come, you know, and, and fine you, you know, or shut you down. So we have state okay. citizens, we have, the, we have, have to have the right to go have, in there. You have to be able to, to operate in the commercial jurisdiction. Yep, because it is a natural right, right, for a man for life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. If the state citizen was considered as a king before, you know, he had all the rights and liabilities, well, he was a sovereign, right, or he had the capacity of sovereign with no subjects. But right. even a sovereign is liable for his contracts. Right. In, in commerce, there, are, there aren't really any sovereigns because if you make an agreement and you violate it, you're liable for it. You know what I'm saying? Because essentially this is how the banks took over the crown or took over the royal family, right, or the church. You know, they always do it through the bank and they do it through debt. <laughs> right. So, so you're, you but you're, basically saying, but you're basically saying in order to operate in commerce, you have to have one aspect of you, you have to have the capacity as a commercial entity. So that's what we see when we see these straw man, straw names. Right. When our names uh, are, but, but all what, caps. what, the all caps, the upper, the, yep. the, uh, the different name styles. But the interesting thing about that to me is we didn't create those different straw men. Those were created, those are basically unauthorized derivatives, aren't they? Uh, the, I don't know, did you use the Social Security number? Did you file it or did the government file it for you? See, I'm still under the impression that that's a voluntary contract. And if you actually even read through the SS5 in the directions, which I'm sure very few people do, it says all mm -hmm. information surrendered is voluntary. You know, they definitely make things difficult because they're also telling people that, well, you can't work without a number, right? So they're, again, they, they created a, right. a that's problem. A, that's a... <laughs> Right. They've created the problem and they've also created the derivatives. Somebody right. decides who created those derivatives where my name is styled either as all caps or styled as the first, the last name all caps and the first two names. I, I did not create those derivatives. So that's just one interesting aspect. I always expected I was operating in trade under uh, a lawful name, not under a legal name. So where's the disclosure in those contracts? Right, well, that could be a complaint, but it has to go, again, you'd have to follow proper procedure. As far as I understand, no one's actually even been able to prove, right, through rules of evidence that a fraud or a criminal, you know, um, action has taken place. Right. Okay. The and rules of evidence that's... become very difficult, and that's where I think, again, because no one was attacking the source of it, I think if, those, if people would focus on that SS5, because now creating the record is one thing, but if, if we become aware that the record is in error and we want to correct it, and they're denying us the ability to correct it, well, that's a denial of free will. That's a denial of, of domicile of choice. That's a violation of the United Nations Charter. So then I, it's a violation of the Constitution. You know, that is a criminal act to deny people the remedy once we found out what is happening. And what was the nature of the denial of your um, letter to correct that? Yeah, that was essentially it. They told me that I didn't give them uh, proper documents to, to show U.S. citizenship or lawful alien status. They said they'll they contact them when I had uh, documents they need or they could come in for a personal interview, which their personal interviews take like two and a half, three months to schedule. Um, that's when okay. I just turned on and filed a claim. Okay, so let's just break that down just a little bit, though. They wanted you to prove you were a lawful alien. Right, which is not possible. Is that what you, is that what you were no. trying to prove? No. No, like I was saying, you know, that's the difference. When, when you look at Block 5, it says legal alien. It doesn't say lawful alien. So my claim so was that I, I was... 
Yeah, they, they came back and said you were not able to prove you were a lawful alien, and in fact, you were not trying to prove that. You were saying you were a legal alien. Correct. Is that right? But, okay, and then also they came back to you and said that you did not prove you were a U.S. citizen. Was that what, were you trying to prove that either? Right. Well, this is the this is the difference between the public and private international law now. Because, like, under public international law, I am a U.S. citizen because I have a U.S. passport, right? My nationality is I have United States of America. I was born in Michigan, a member state to the Union. So I gave them a U.S. passport. I checked off legal alien, and they're telling me that they can't process it. When you applied for your passport, what was yeah. your status on the documents? on your application how did you apply as what oh pretty much all the same I did this the last time I renewed my passport I did not check off US citizen okay um, because I had read a lot of that you know information going around um, about changing your passport okay the one thing I, the one thing I can add to that just because why I don't think the passport really matters I mean as far as your your legal rights go is there's a document that was put out by the American Bar Association which I know a lot of people are gonna freak out because it came from lawyers <laughs> but mm -hmm. this is, is an article about basic conflict of laws principles and right in they start breaking it down and they talk about nationality which would be your passport that you that's showing your nationality and it said, although generally nationality does not play a significant role in conflict of laws analysis by U.S. courts, it is an area of law with which a multinational estate planner should be familiar. So they're going right in there saying the nationality, um, there's other, it is commonly said that a person can have several residences but only one domicile. Further confusing mm -hmm. matters, the term residence and domicile are often used interchangeably but with different meanings in various types of statutes. So you can see how they're playing, this is the word, where they're jumping between what I, what I see as two different bodies of law, public international and private international law. And, the, and people are confused by it, and they're taking advantage of that. So when you apply for your passport, let's just say you consider yourself uh, just a state citizen or, or even a state national, no citizenship in anything, and you absolutely do not agree to be a United a US citizen in other words having citizenship under Congress um, how would you how do you make that distinction when you apply for your passport do you have any uh, well, opinion about me, that? Or? yeah it's it's contextual so if I'm fine for a passport so it's like this so a legal person a juristic person right a legal fiction does not have a nationality it doesn't, it's not even a real entity, right? It doesn't have a political status. It only has a legal status. So when you're applying for a passport, it's in relation to a man, a being. So again, that's, that is showing your political status, and it really has no bearing on your civil status. You know, this is going back to the court case I said at the beginning where the judge and they're telling you that one could be completely different than the other. So when I claim a U.S. citizen under nationality, you know, as a political status, that has nothing to do with my civil status and whether I'm a U.S. citizen, a state citizen, a, a foreign national, you know, a lawful alien, you know, because I might be domiciled in Germany. And that would make me a lawful alien. Does that make sense? No. <laughs> I'm, sure you, I'm sure you explained it well, but it's so confusing. Um, yeah, there, it's the layers, it's, it's the difference between the public and private international law that seems to be the foundation of trying to really grasp the different contexts in which they use the terminology. Um, because, mm -hmm. like I said, you just, there is no way for a, so McDonald's does not have a political status. You know, that it's impossible for McDonald's to claim to have a political status. It's not even real, mm -hmm. right? It's a legal fiction. It's a, it's a, it's a legal entity. Okay, so, so just to clarify a little bit, when you apply for a passport, that's the man applying? Yeah. Is that what you're saying? That's just a man that's, applying. It's not, it's, not yep. a, it's not a straw man applying for the passport. Nope. They might, and then they, come, they spit it all in all caps and everything, but again, it doesn't say, it says nationality, it doesn't say U.S. citizen, it says United States of America. And it would be kind of, you know, a hard, it would be a break in logic to say that a legal fiction, a straw man, could have a political status. 
because it's not a real thing. How could it belong to a nation of people when it's not even a, you know, a, per, a, a real being? So the first, say, time you applied for your passport, you did check the U.S. citizen box, and the second time you yep. didn't, right. what, um, what would you say, is that the only difference between the two applications, just checking that box or not? Well, I think it's interesting to remember, too, that it doesn't even ask for your citizenship on the passport application. It asks for your parents' citizenship or if you had married someone that was a U.S. Right. citizen. Right. So that's right. A, it's an interesting another little, you know, detail. It's like, well, so I'm not even claiming to be a U.S. citizen. They're asking me if my parents were, and they asked me if I married somebody that was a U.S. citizen. You know, and, and to um, me, that goes to... That goes to nationality because you take on the character yep. of your father's nationality. Yep. Right, um, or through marriage. Right, where your, your father's father domicile. Birth? That would be your father's domicile. You take on your do father's domicile. But also on the uh, U.S. passport application, uh, it says right on there, country, if outside the, the United States, and that's where you'd put in um, USA, United States of America. So you are kind of... Okay. Um, breaking it apart and letting them know. Yeah. Okay. I, I, and then yeah, I believe it's... Did you yeah, adjust your ahead. address? Sorry. Uh, sorry. Um, did you adjust your address also? Yes. Uh, correct. Yeah, most people do the in care of, you know, zip exempt, all that, all that stuff. Um, but right. that's what I'm saying. It, it is my understanding now that with the civil status correct, a lot of these attachments, all these problems with... Um, the courts and the governments are based off the civil status. So to me, that's where the political status really kind of takes a back seat, or it's not, it's not really a hot issue. Um, at least that's what the court cases are telling me. That's what case law says, you know. So I guess it depends on how you want to interpret it, but this is what the standing law has been saying, is that it's the domicile, the, it's the civil status, and it has nothing to do with your political status. The political status actually does sometimes play a role, but only in civil law countries right? Not in common law. If you are living in a civil law country, then sometimes your nationality will come into play to settle a conflict of laws issue. But I'm not too familiar with that because I've not really, re I have no reason to research civil law. <laughs> one, we one, live thing in that's, we, one thing that's so interesting about this um, is that here we are, there's tremendous conflict of laws and um, we're trying to shoot in the dark and feel around in the dark and not know even what type of law we're coming under. Um, yep. You know, it, it just needs to be, it needs to be more simplified. It, it, um, and, I, and I think common law is, is simple to understand. I think this crazy conflict of laws has something to do with the legal society being involved for, for so long. And, and the purpose seems to be to deceive us and to confuse us. Yeah. Anyway, that's Absolutely. That's yeah. Mike, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, and Mike, you, were, you started to say something, I think. Yeah, I was saying, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, they do use uh, um, word, word games and... Um, there, there is some, there, there's definitely deceit in there, constructive fraud. Um, there's no doubt about that. Um, but that's why you have to really, uh, what, I've, what I've been learning lately is you really have to pay attention to what you're reading to decipher what's being said. I mean, words, <laughs> uh, and, and, there's, and there's multiple contexts that a word can be used. So, and, that's, and that's part of the, the, the word games. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's one thing that came out of um, studying Carl Lentz, and I studied his his theory, I guess, or philosophy by working with Gus Breton, who was one of his uh, real close uh, friends, and he talked about synonyms, and there not really being any synonyms. Uh, words mean things, so a word means one thing, and so what. One of the things that happened during the deliberate dumbing down of America, basically, is that um, we were taught that there were synonyms for everything, and that, that's definitely how it works with terms of art. It can mean it's, 
it's the meaning you think it means plus its exact opposite meaning in a lot of situations, just like this citizenship and domicile uh, being considered to be synonymous. Uh, yep. Yeah, it's a it's lot of not, just legal trickery. Mm -hmm. It's not, uh, they are not synonymous. You know, that's, so it's, it's good for people to understand that, that, you know, number one, you're being lied to. Um, well, I, it's the only defense really is having a higher understanding, right? Now, knowledge is the key that is going to give you the ability to, to decipher, you know, to understand the world around you. And their tricks only work as long as we don't know what they are, right? As soon as you find out what it is, you're no longer going, you cannot be enslaved in that same manner anymore, right? It's been, so in the bigger scope of things, this has been a constant evolution of society as a whole that I see taking place of what started as, you know, a great new experiment called the United States of America, where each mm -hmm. person was given the status as a sovereign entity, right, who had no obligations or liability to, to a king or to some higher ruling power, right, other than God, you know, your creator, you know, those natural rights that were endowed with, endowed with their natural rights from their, from their creator. That, the, once that took place, that was the, the ruling powers across the world saw you know, in advance, the threat that that was. We, I don't believe we, this is part of the reason we've never really experienced peace here. I mean, I think we've been under a constant attack with all the banking wars, with the civil war, with, you know, the world wars that were instigated. This is all to keep us in a state of confusion, to keep us preoccupied, um, so they can continue to manipulate, so they can continue to sit on top, you know, and play games. Right, yep. But how do we, how do we take back control and just it's up to us to simplify things you know yep. it's not up to it's not up to people that are committing fraud against us to simplify things for us that's up to us um, and my belief and understanding is that we need to claim common law which is basically our biblical law it's you know, it's based on the Hebrew scriptures and the New Testament. And so we just have to say, okay, we're laying down the law. Uh, and we can get into that more later. But but just kind of getting back to this, um, this uh, idea of citizenship, domicile, and nationality. And we, mm -hmm. we talked about this. You, you, Mike said something about you take on the, your father's domicile. But from what I understand under uh, Law of Nations, your nationality is based on where your father was, the land that your father was born on. So if you go back to that European model versus, you know, the map mm -hmm. of the United States. My father was born on the land of New York State. I was born yep. in Germany when he was um, in Germany, you know, as a, as a military officer. So my nationality is, I've just reclaimed New York as my, I'm a, I'm a New Yorker by. Right. Well, just like by in the government style. Well, in the and government my domicile, what's that? I was just going to say, those are all what they're talking about in the government styles manual. I think it's 5.23. They break down the 50 nationalities. Right of all the right. all the fifty independent states, so that okay. yeah would just be verifying that those are all separate entities with their own people with their own nationality. Sure. So you guys are on Michigan or Michiganders, Mi is that right? Uh, Mich Michiganians. Michiganians. Yep. Okay, Michiganian. Everybody that. thinks it's Michigander, but it's Michiganian. According okay, to well, what's in the government styles manual, yeah. <laughs> I I knew we met for a purpose tonight. Now we know. <laughs> That is very cool. So, all right. So, you guys are Michiganians. Maybe, um, maybe. So, so Patrick, your father is Mike. Mike was born on the state of Michigan. Is that right? Correct. Okay. And then Mike was your father born on that state, or? Yes. Okay. And how far yes, back do you go? Uh. I'm the second generation. My grandfather immigrated from Switzerland. Okay, very good. So you know right who you are and where yep. you came from. Yep. Okay. And 
And your grandfather, what was his naturalization process? Did he? He came in through. He came in through Ellis Island. Okay. And he went to he, Michigan. Yeah. Yeah. West Branch, and Michigan, from Ellis Island. And I'm not sure. I don't. Yeah. I'd have to um, check, but I was trying to find out if he actually became a state citizen because a lot of people does, don't understand that once you uh, immigrant in and you're naturalized, uh, once you go to a state and you create your domicile, then you can become a state citizen. Right. Yeah, you don't you don't have to remain a U.S. citizen for yeah forever <laughs> for the rest of your life you, just because you naturalized here. And at that time, at that time, naturalization was to a state, not to the United States and D.C. So your oath of allegiance yeah. was to the state, state. not Correct. to Washington, D.C. So that kind of tells us a lot, too. Um, his, his domicile, that meant he was going to permanently live there. His house was there. That was where he was going to, was going to, pretty much set up shop and then if he left there and went um, back to his home country, his plan was always to come back to Michigan after that, probably. Yes. So that's, that's domicile, right? Yes. And yep. then he established, he established the, the ability for you to be in Michigan. Okay, Michiganian. I, I want to say <laughs> Okay, a Michiganian. <laughs> <laughs> and for yeah. Patrick to be Michiganian and for subsequent gen generations to claim nationality there. And yeah, and I, I've just been looking at, at this a lot lately. I looked at, um, you know, it's probably against Bill's wishes that I claim to be a New Yorker because that's not one of his favorite kind of people in this world. But <laughs> <laughs> but I... I am claiming to be a native New Yorker because I looked at it and it is um, we've we've had people in New York all the way back to the 1750s in White Plains wow. and then um, yeah uh, back further in the 1620s uh, Simon Hoyt came over on a ship called the Abigail um, and it became the Hyatt family and my ancestor, Abraham Hyatt, was uh, an officer in the Revolution for um, his area, 4th Battalion of New York Forces, and um, fought in the Revolutionary War. So I'm claiming New York because it, yeah. it's not really about me. My it's nationality about a lot of history. is... There's a lot of history there. Absolutely. So, and it's, they were not um, city dwellers. They weren't under... To me, city dwellers and city and law of the city and civil law, they all go together, and country and law of the land and common law all kind of go together. So these were, these were New Yorker country folks. Um, mm -hmm. Later on, my, my one grandfather came from Spain, ran away from Spain when he was 16, um, went to New York, came through Ellis Island, went to New York, and he, that's the reason why we, we the we, the Spanish and Italian side of the family, ran into these um, these uh, longtime New Yorkers that were revolutionary people. So uh, the the reason I think about nationality that way because it's a long history. It's not just me. I didn't just, you know, I I'm here, but I need to understand who I am based on who these people were. So it's. Yep. You know, I like to think about it that way. And I also like to think about these uh, people in D.C. running all these fraud scams as being a criminal cartel. And if I'm dumb enough to uh, put myself and place myself underneath what it is they're doing, then, um, you know, too bad for me. I need to be, I need to, to see it, as you say, and not be able to be so easily tricked. Right. Well, it's kind of, it's a good example too. Like you could claim like, so your nationality, your political status as a New Yorker is one thing, but now you're living 
in Alaska, right? So technically that would be two. So your legal status would be as an Alaskan. Your political status would be as a New Yorker. Does that make sense? How, see how you can have two different capacities, but now the political status has nothing to do with your legal standing and your contracts and your business, whatever you do in your business capacity, because that's all law, law domicile. So that would all be relegated under Alaska because that's the situs, right? That's your physical presence. Yeah, that's where my house is, to put it right. in simple terms. It's where we yep. actually live, and if we leave here, we're coming back here, and this is where we're going to stay. So that's right. to me is domicile, and that long history um, in New York is nationality. And, and yep. that's, I could be wrong, but that's, that's where I'm at right now. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and whether it's called legally called, um, um, political status or civil status, that's still where, where I'm not sure. I don't have a real solid basis for understanding what that is. And maybe we can, maybe we can talk more about that. Um, in yeah, well, that's part of it. I mean, sure. it, it, the, the biggest thing that I have in relation to that is that court case that I led with. Um, and part of like what we're talking about now, see, it gets a little more complicated in the 30s because of what they did to the money. Um, when they went off the gold and they went with the Federal Reserve System that was using, because they started using securities as mm -hmm. currency. And in order to use securities as currency, you need to have a bond, right? You need to have an, something underwriting it. This is why they pledged the property of U.S. citizens to underwrite the securities that were being printed by the Federal Reserve System. This is the green note currency that we see everywhere today in opposition to the United States notes, which were red seal. Those are the ones that were backed by gold or silver in alignment with the Constitution. So you can okay, see so how does that, how does that, how does that um, play into the status issue? The, you know, how the money is printed and what underlies the money system, why does that have to do anything with us and our status? Part of it, because under okay. the Constitution, go, go ahead. Did somebody say well, something? I was going to say, part, part of it is, is that because all the people migrated over to be U.S. citizens, so they no longer had to print the U.S. note. You could see, so they first went off the gold in the 30s, but they didn't get completely off silver until, was it late 60s or early 70s? Well, that was 30 70s. years after, that was 30 years, 40 years after the 1935 Social Security Act. So it is my, you know, I guess, theory or guess that it, that's how long it took for them to get the whole generation of state citizens to appear as U.S. citizens through the, social, through the SS5 application. Because see, the Constitution, as far as printing lawful money backed by gold and silver, that would only only state citizens could claim that that right or that form of money. A U.S. citizen cannot claim any form of money because they're subjects of Congress, right? They're do they have to do what they're told. Yeah, I was just going to go for that court case, that Riem court case that says there's only one way to become a U.S. citizen. Are you familiar with that case? Yeah, uh, I'd probably come across it, but not off the top of my head, no. <laughs> is, that, is that the one where you're talking about through naturalization, the only way? The only, there's, there's only one way to become a citizen, and that's where you, um, I'm not reading it off of there, so um, I'm looking for court cases. Yeah, here we go. Let me, let me find it, so yep. I'm reading it straight yep. off. Yep. While you're, while you're looking for that, I'll, I'll just make a comment. A, a few weeks back when Roger from uh, Florida made the comment that you heard from Anna that Trump was standing firm that we're all statutory citizens. And that kind of goes along with... U.S. citizens, yeah. Yeah, statutory U.S. citizens, which kind of goes along with, yeah, we're all contracted out. So what, was Roger saying that was a bad thing? I hope. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So Trump, Trump is basically doubling down, is what you're saying. Yeah. If if that okay. comment is, is is correct, that's just he accurate, was just reading yeah. it. Yeah, if it's accurate. 
Well, I don't meddle in their elections or their politics, so I'm I'm not a citizen of Washington. So whatever happens, that's right. all business. You know, they're bankrupt, and that's business. <clears throat> but what I do <laughs> is a whole different situation based on law. Um, here it is: City of Minneapolis versus Rome, R E U M. Um, and do I have the case site? No. It says, only one way be to become U.S. citizen, make voluntary application, have oath accepted by competent authority, and have this in the public records and not otherwise. So you have to really mean to do it. You have to forsake all other kingdoms. Well, yeah, but they said, what was the first thing? Voluntary application? Make voluntary application. Is that, would that not meet the definition of the SS5? Could be, but have oath accepted by competent authority, and then place this in the public record. I don't know. Yeah, if I'd be the commissioner of Social Security. And uh, what about the oath? Is there well, an oath? That, thing? that may be where the 1040 comes in because you're swearing under penalties of perjury. Could be. Yeah. Could be. I don't so, know. Yeah. That's, it's, this is the it's interesting, though, that that. The Social Security Administration, well, I don't know if they denied you the ability to correct your status based on what you said, or if they just sent you a response that didn't. To me, it was a nonsensical response. Because right. you weren't yeah, it, claiming. Yeah, you weren't because claiming. They, sent me, they sent me documentation about Social Security numbers for non-citizens and non-U.S. citizens. And well, I put in a, uh, a passport from the United States. So how would I be claiming to be a non-U.S. citizen because I checked legal alien? See, that's they they don't understand the difference between public international law and private international law, right? And like you're saying, because I wasn't claiming to be a lawful alien, right? Not right. You have a passport. Was. So they were saying prima facie evidence: you must not be a yeah a lawful alien but they don't understand you were claiming to be a legal alien. Right. And it's yeah. actually funny because okay. I, I did have a conversation with a lady that worked at Social Security Administration who had been there for, I think she said, 10 years now. Previous to this, she was a paralegal. And uh, this, I went in because I had originally put an application in back in May, and they processed it. And I checked off legal alien, and I was shocked. It just went straight through. I was like, oh, cool, that was easy. You know, like that was much better than I expected. So everyone else that tried to do the same thing that I was in communication with was getting nothing but problems, which, of course, raised out in my mind. So I went down there to ask them uh, to verify my record, at which time she looked it up and it said, well, it says you're a U.S. citizen. I said, see. So they processed my form back in May, and the lady never even looked at it. Now, uh -huh. guess, what they, guess what they do with those SS5s you submit? They shred them. They don't scan them. They don't keep a copy. They shred them. So that the only evidence is voluntary on spot, right, where you verbally or uh, visually inspect the record, and once, once it's done, once you leave, there is no evidence to establish what, what was said or done. It's been destroyed. And I had a conversation with her talking about how this had to pertain with tax status and law of domicile issues and the United States being a foreign government in relation to the state of Michigan, in which she, whether she was doing it to keep the peace, but she fully agreed with everything that I was saying. For whatever you know that's worth you know again I don't know if she was being honest or if she was just trying to appease me you know in this situation the moment but she says yeah she was aware of a lot of it and you know she did paralegal work previous to working at Social Security but now because of the Homeland Security 9-11 they've been kind of locked out of their system where she said there's certain things that I'm not even allowed to go in and do anymore so they're so, even more compartmentalized since 9-11 uh, they it's just Correct. yeah, and that's yeah. when Homeland Security came in. Now, my understanding of Homeland Security is again, it's securities protection, financial securities, not physical security, not not physical protection. This is they're talking about Homeland Security. They're talking about all the financial instruments that are out in the markets that are underwritten by U.S. citizens. And if people wise up and change their status, they're going to lose all their people and all their underwriting. They would cease yeah. to have any power or authority. 
Well, it seems like we're a long way off from all the people doing this. It's, <laughs> you know, they even have yeah. 3% of the people that can gain it starts understanding. with one, yeah. Yeah. Have you looked into, um, have you looked at correcting your status via the paperwork that's put out by Anna Von Rice on her website in article number 928? I think my dad probably speak to that better than me. Yeah. Yeah, I did all of Anna's paperwork. I, I called the process. Go ahead. I was just going to say that my, my process that I first tried for status correction was what Winston Schrott was putting out for um, kind of trying to overcome the, the problems of the SS5. I actually had a phone conversation with him, which I just blank asked him. I was like, well, why don't people go down and change their status to legal alien? And his response is, oh, they won't let you do that. Um, I believe this is why, again, he because he just got sentenced to, what, 10 years, I believe, for tax. Right. Uh, evasion or whatever for not filing. So I believe because he didn't change his status for SS5. His response to me asking a question was they won't let you do it. So that's where I still see that this is the nexus or this is the, the source point. There's something foundational here that really needs to be um, addressed or looked into. So, so I'm going to go back to Mike. Um, you filed the paperwork that Anna von Wright recommends filing and have you had any um, any uh, experience that would say that that was worthwhile and worth doing? Uh, I don't know because I've never really used it. Uh, you know, I, I completed it, had it notarized, recorded it, um, but I've never filed any notices with anybody. You know, okay. to, to see if it would work or not. Okay. And. Uh, so you weren't, in, you haven't been involved in any kind of a test of it. No. Is was part of your process um, writing to the secretary of of the U.S. Treasury? Yes, which later Anna said not to do that process anymore because There's of the bank. Later, yeah, she said that was no longer a viable action to take. But I did, I did do that. I sent a birth certificate. Um, I do have my authenticated birth certificate from uh, my Secretary of State and the State Department. Uh, I did the same for my wife. And um, one of my other sons, I did it. But um, now I haven't had the experience but now my son had tried using it, and, and this is where I don't know much about the, the legal system and the court system that we currently have and use, but um, mm -hmm. he tried to use it in a divorce case, and they just threw it out. They said, ah, oh, this is gibberish. This means nothing. So it, it did not work for him. But coming back to... Patrick's theory, what he's saying is it's no different than an affidavit. If you don't have the proper standing, they can do whatever they want. Well, I will use what came up in conversation with my dad previously um, when we talked about all of this stuff, is that when you rely on your political status for contractual things, it's like you're trying to say you're expatriating from a contract, mm -hmm. right? That just doesn't, doesn't make sense. How, you can't expatriate from a con, from a legal contract. So, and that's where the conflict of laws. That's where the political status really doesn't come into play here. Um, it's a it's a legal obligation, and so it is a different system of law that we have to acknowledge or look into and understand if we're going to you know protect ourselves. Yeah, and I'm wondering if you would be able to um, use the paperwork that Anna von Wright um, advocates for, and then use that paperwork in order to change your SS-5. So in other words, write to Social Security along with that paperwork and tell them to change your status. And then see but if at that point you will be able to do it, if they would have to acknowledge that. Yeah, it's possible. Right, my current my current train of thought is to again first I, I've got the claim in through my attorney general for Michigan, 
um, awaiting their response yet because I did it within the last uh, probably two weeks. And they said typically it's 30 days, they, you'll get some sort of response, which I plan on actually calling tomorrow to follow up on to see where they're at. I know if they do an investigation, you can then file for a FOIA for whatever they discover in their investigation. So that would give you whatever evidence you possibly need, documented evidence, to then file your claim, you know, criminal complaint against the Social Security Administration for, you know, essentially a conspiracy against rights. Mm -hmm. And are you um, familiar? Well, oh, okay, go ahead. go ahead. Mike, go ahead. Okay, uh, what I say, that is something I could try, since I have the paperwork done, uh, I could go down mm -hmm. because I went down and, and, yeah, they wouldn't even, they didn't even want to follow their, procedure as far as the name. I mean, there's deception on how you fill the form out as far as your name goes. Because they, yep. they tell you, they tell you it's self-explanatory on the application, but if you look online, it says, no, you have to convert it to, you know, your given name and your surname. Just and like the, the common the, Yeah, and, and the local office, don't, it, they're not even aware of it. They wouldn't want to take it. They're trying to tell me I have to have a court order, you know, and I'm going, no. But, but that is that is something I could probably try is take that down there, and and submit it with it, and and see what they say. I do have a thought Partly. that might be a solution on that, and that would be to write to them, write a letter rather than using their form. So mm -hmm. what you'd have to have is the name of the man or woman who is at the very tippy top of the Social Security Administration and write to that man or woman as the man or woman who at times acts as the, uh, and then put in their title. I, I, I am man, write to you the man or, or woman, whichever it is, who at times acts as the blankety blank for the Social Security Administration to let you know blah, 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 blah. So what you're going to do is you're going to, rather than use the form, you're going to write a letter. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be the the common law, the common lawyer type of solution to that issue, because when you use the form, it's going to be shuffle. It, it, it's going to have to be done through their system, you know, and and you can't you can't put a a square peg into a round hole in their system. It, everything has to be square pegs. Yeah. But if you write your own handmade letter, that that handmade letter, it's handwritten, it's from a man. It's obviously, you know, somebody who's living. Um, and you sign and seal that letter. Uh, that could be a way to handle it. So just a thought. Anyway, we can get into more yeah. on lift writing and declaration making um, later, too. Um, hopefully have Gus Bratton on to talk about that. He's a master of letter writing. Um, so, um, and then Patrick, I, I don't know what it was, what we were talking about, but you started to say something about correcting your status on the SS5 some other way, I think. Oh, none, I mean, just a little bit. I, I don't remember what I was going to say then. Um, okay. But yeah, it's just, I, I see this being, a, it's, it's a foundation and it's not even a necessity, right? You don't, there is no obligation to get involved in securities, right? Any private man can do private business with other private men all he wants. The problem comes in is when that private man wants to do business with public entities and corporations. And that is the purpose of having the legal status, uh, from my understanding. Like right now, I could go out and do private contracts with any other private man that I want. They're not going to stop me. And if I, in that private contract, assign a third, a third party arbitrator in case of a disagreement, I, I think the courts would have a really hard time establishing jurisdiction, right? Because that would be involvement in a private contract, which is a big no-no for them. I, th I so, think what's really probably, oh, go ahead, f finish, and then I'll, I'll give No, it go, you can go. I mean, that was that, you, you, can, you can go. Okay, so I was just going to say, I think, I think the issue is more an issue of personage and baritry than it is that corporations can engage in trade with man. I believe they can. But in order to bring, basically in order to make it, quote, an equal playing field, 
in order to be able to and 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 I you know I don't know I don't know how that works mm-hmm. I think you have to have a given I think you have to have a, a trade name in order to do that but you can engage in trade um, that's that's an issue that's an issue that that I'm not sure about um, and I think it's important but personage is and baritry basically come into play here because at some point in order to gain jurisdiction you your given name has been unlawfully converted without your knowledge or consent into a corporate uh, legal name so that so that basically these corporations that are operating as governments can bring you down to their level because basically man is at the top of the pecking order and and citizens are at the bottom so we want to convert you somehow down to our yeah, level yeah but that's what it's important to remember again like you're saying the different layers here because not all citizens are created equal You'll notice that after the 14th Amendment is when they started talking about American citizens. Well, what the heck is an American citizen? Well, you might, because this, this is the dual nature of our system now. You could be a U.S. citizen or you may be a state citizen. And those are two completely different, you know, um, statuses that you can operate from that give you different legal defenses or, you know, different vulnerabilities. And the courts have already said this. So, and that's what everyone says citizen. Well, of course, if the United States has more than one meaning, then a U.S. citizen must have more than one meaning. Sure, no, and, and that's true. I was just, as, I was just talking right. about picking or generally. Um, a straw man is at the bottom, say, <clears throat> um, and the man, just man, and is, um, uh, well, I wouldn't say it's a natural state, but in his created state is at the top of the pecking order in all common law countries. Right, but now, so what is your understanding as far as me as a private man, as a natural person, I create, I create my own straw man. It's an extension of me. So well, you're, you're, how, that, that is, that entity, that straw man, if I'm the registered owner of that straw man, is that, would that not be considered my private property, my intellectual property? Definitely, yeah. Okay, so we can say that just because you're operating a straw man doesn't mean you've lost all your legal rights. Oh, no, 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 that's, okay. that's totally fine. You can engage in trade through that straw man. You can enter into contracts through that straw man, and I think maybe you can even, uh, you can enter into um, contracts with corporations. You just can't, you just can't create securities. I think I, I, at some point maybe there's a a reason mm-hmm. why you have to own a corporation, uh, but I'm not sure where that line is. So that's something we need to we need right. to continue to. Yeah, there's to, there's definitely a lot more study and, and research to to do. <laughs> definitely, yep, yep. But I think as far as um, I'm concerned, if you guys just want to um, sign off or just. Uh, have some parting words and then we can continue this discussion next time. Oh, Any parting? You want to say? Yeah. Oh, we're still okay. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. We don't, I, maybe well, we'll, I'd just like to say, hopefully this, this, this will lead to uh, more, more research and, and uh, more dialogue and, and lead us where we need to go. Yeah, and that, I, this I, is, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Patrick. Yeah, so that, I guess, yeah, that's where I, the biggest surprise to me, because this is relatively new. I mean, it was within the last probably three or four months. And this was, you know, something I kind of come across when I was studying with um, somebody that is a, you know, goes by a private attorney general. You know, does a lot of these commercial processes and different things. And there were certain documents that come across that I read through and was just kind of like, well, hey, what, you know, what's going on? Because no one's talking about this. Um, right. There may be nothing to it. I don't know. But as far as I can see, I mean, I've, I've researched a lot of different people in this field, and this seems to be like a, a, a topic that is not getting any, any discussion 
uh, any investigation or, or any kind of feedback to see, well, what would this lead to? You know, I see a lot of people, even like on the drill assembly call, who, you know, when you try to say, well, maybe a lot of what they're doing is not so criminal. Maybe it's because of an improper record. Maybe it's because of there's certain things that we don't understand. And morally, is it wrong? Yes. But legally, it's, it's not really crossing the line. You know, and we can go into morals, the morals of that all you want, but essentially, at the end of the day, it's, it is business, and it's not an emotional thing. I think a lot of people, it's hard to take a step back, and re- because of the injury, because of the harm that, that people have felt because of this, to get kind of a clear picture um, without being kind of clouded with, you know, emotional reactions to it. But it's more or less just wanting to have that open discussion. Um, I don't know if it's right. I don't know if there's anything to it. I, I think that there is. I think there's a lot of substance to to the research, to the court case sites, you know, that I like to rely on much more than any code, you know, especially if you come from the common law. I mean, the court sites to me is what really sets these principles or these precedents that that establish a long-standing, you know, norm that has to be adhered to. So hopefully, yeah, just through the discussion and people trying to, you know, expand their understanding a little bit more and we can come to a better understanding than like you're saying, simplify this. How can you really break it down and make it easy to digest um, so that people of, you know, every walk of life can really start to grasp and integrate it without doing all the hours <laughs> of research and reading and legwork and experimenting, you know, so that we can all kind of move past this. Yeah, and, uh, you know, the average guy doesn't have 10 years to put into this. Yeah. I mean, so I, I don't think law was ever meant to be so complicated. So, yeah, we, I, I think we're headed in the right direction. We'll continue to meet, and we'll, meet, we'll talk offline about when, when a good time is to meet. But I think you're okay. on to something with this SS5, and, and we'll look forward, really, at least one aspect of next week's show talking about um, if you've gotten an answer and, and where you're going to go from there would be a good good point of discussion. Yep. Ho- hopefully I'll have some yeah something to report. Like I said, I, I will probably call that down and check with the with my attorney general um, tomorrow and and see what kind of response um, they have. Sounds good. Let's go ahead and shut the recording off and and. Uh, then we can schedule offline what what we want to do when we want to talk next and um, okay.